Chapter Twenty of A Daughter of Today by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. July thickened down upon London. The society papers announced that, with the exception of the few unfortunate gentlemen who were compelled to stay and look after their constituents' interests at Westminster, everybody had gone out of town and filled up yawning columns with detailed information as to everybody's destination to an experienced eye with the point of view of the top of an uxbridge road omnibus for instance it might not appear that london had diminished more than to the extent of a few powdered footmen on carriage boxes but the census of the london world is after all not to be taken from the top of an uxbridge road omnibus london teemed emptily the tall houses in the narrow lanes of mayfair slept standing the sunlight filtered through a depressing haze and stood still in the streets for hours together in the park the policemen wooed the nursery maids free from the embarrassing smiling scrutiny of people to whom this serious preoccupation is a diversion the main thoroughfares were full of summer sales st paul's echoed to admiring transatlantic criticism and the bloomsbury boarding-houses to voluble transatlantic complaint the halifaxes were at brighton lady halifax giving musical teas miss halifax painting marine views in a little book miss halifax called them impressions and always distributed them at the musical teas the cardiffs had gone to scotland for golf and later for grouse janet was almost as expert on the links as her father and on very familiar terms with a certain highland moor and one donald macleod they had laid every compulsion upon elfrida to go with them in vain the girl's sensitiveness on the point of money obligations was intense and janet failed to measure it accurately when she allowed herself to feel hurt that their relations did not preclude the necessity for taking any thought as to who paid elfrida stayed however in her byway of fleet street and did a little bit of excellent work for the illustrated age every day if it had not been for the editor-in-chief rattray would have extended her scope on the paper but the editor-in-chief said no miss bell was dangerous there was no telling what she might be up to if they gave her the reins she went very well but she was all the better for the severest kind of a bit so miss bell wrote about colonial exhibitions and popular spectacles and country outings for babies of the slums and longed for a fairer field as midsummer came on there arrived a dearth in these objects of orthodox interest and rattray told her she might submit anything on the nail that occurred to her in addition to such work as the office could give her to do then in spite of the editor-in-chief an odd unconventional bit of writing crept now and then into the age an interview with some eccentric notability which read like a page from jip a bit of pathos picked out of the common streets a fragment of character drawing which smiled visibly and talked audibly elfrida in her garret drew a joy from these things she cut them out and read them over and over again and put them sacredly away with natty's letters and a manuscript poem of a certain brunotin's and a scrawl from one hackoff with a vigorous sketch of herself from memory in pen and ink in the corner of the page in the little eastern smelling wooden box which seemed to her to represent the core of her existence they quickened her pulse they gave her a curious uplifted happiness that took absolutely no account of any other circumstance there were days when mrs jordan had real twinges of conscience about the quality of miss bell's stake but there mrs jordan would soothe herself i might bring her the best soline and she wouldn't know no difference in other practical respects the girl was equally indifferent her clothes were shabby and she did not seem to think of replacing them 
mrs jordan made preposterous charges for candles and she paid them without question she tipped people who did little services for her with a kind of royal delicacy the girl who scrubbed the landings worshipped her and the boy who came every day for her copy once brought her a resplendent buttonhole consisting of two pink rosebuds and a scarlet geranium tendering it with a shy lie to the effect that he had found it in the street she went alone now and again to the opera taking an obscure place and she lived a good deal among the foreign art exhibitions of bond street once she bought an etching and brought it home under her arm that kept her poor for a month though she would have been less aware of it if she had not before the month was out wanted to buy another a great parisian actress had made her yearly visit to london in june and elfrida conjuring with the name of the illustrated age won an appointment from her the artiste stayed only a fortnight she declared that one half of an english audience came to see her because it was proper and the other because it was sinful and she found it insupportable and in that time she asked elfrida three times to pay her morning visits when she appeared in her dressing-gown little unconventional visits pour bavarder when miss bell lacked entertainment during the weeks that followed she thought of these visits and little smiles chased each other round the corners of her mouth she wrote to janet when she was in the mood delicious scraps of letters broad-margined fantastic each so far as charm went a little literary gem disguised in wilfulness in a picture in a diamond-cut cynicism that shone sharper and clearer for the dainty affectation of its setting when she was not in the mood she did not write at all with an instinctive recognition of the demands of any relation such as she felt her friendship with janet cardiff to be she simply refrained from imposing upon her anything that savoured of dullness or commonplaceness so that sometimes she wrote three or four times in a week and sometimes not at all for a fortnight sometimes covered pages and sometimes sent three lines and a row of asterisks there was a fancifulness in the hour as well that usually made itself felt all through the letter it was rainy twilight in her garret or a grey wideness was creeping up behind st paul's which meant that it was morning to what she herself was actually doing or to any material fact about her they made the very slightest reference janet in scotland perceived half of this and felt aggrieved on the score of the other half she wished more often than she said she did that elfrida were a little more human that she had a more appreciative understanding of the warm value of everyday matter between people who were interested in one another the subtle imprisoned soul in elfrida's letters always spoke to hers but janet never received so artistic a missive of three lines that she did not wish it were longer and she had no fund of confidence to draw on to meet her friend's incomprehensible spaces of silence to cover her real soreness she scolded chaffed brusquely affected lofty sarcasms twelve days ago she wrote you mentioned casually that you were threatened with pneumonia your communication of to-day you devote to proving that hector malot is a carpenter i agree with you with reservations but the sequence worries me in the meantime have you had the pneumonia her own letters were long and gossiping full of the scent of the heather and the eccentricities of donald macleod and she wrote them regularly twice a week using rainy afternoons for the purpose and every inch of the paper at her disposal elfrida put a very few of them into the wooden box just as she would have embalmed if she could a very few of the half-hours they had spent together
End of chapter 20